I think we can probably get started. Uh, my name is Professor Doug Hilton. I'm director of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. Is that sound okay for everybody? Yep. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Deacon Edge at Federation Square for what is a, a really wonderful collaboration between Federation Square's Light in Winter Festival and the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. And I think it's particularly apt this year because I, no doubt you've seen the light sculpture as you've walked in, which is the helix tree. I was fortunate to be here when the helix tree was turned on uh, about a week ago. It was sung up by the Australian Youth Choir and was a really fabulous event. It's uh, really appropriate for 2013's Lighting Winter Forum to be around the helix because it's now 60 years since Watson and Crick and their collaborators in Cambridge solved the structure of DNA. DNA is that molecule that unites all of us and, and unites humanity with the rest of the biological world. And today's forum is going to explore four aspects of DNA. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Drew, Ke Drew Carey, I was going to say, Drew Berry, um, who is from the Walsh and Eliza Hall Institute and who I described as the Baz Luhrmann of science animation, but who was a little bit disappointed and really thought of himself as the Quin Quentin Tarantino of science animation. Drew is going to introduce you to DNA and its complexity and how it's replicated through a series of science animations that he's going to narrate. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to genomics, and I'm not going to focus just on the last 10 years, which is where people traditionally look, but I'm going to give you an introduction into the last 100 years of progress in understanding heredity and DNA. I'm going to give you a taste of what the future might hold, but that, that challenge is really going to be taken up by Dr. Alicia Oshlak, who is Head of Bioinformatics at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And, and I hope what Alicia is going to do is to give you a taste of the challenge that we have handling the vast amounts of information that can be generated now about DNA. And then finally, we're going to have Lowen Skane, who is from the University of Melbourne uh, Law Faculty, who is going to talk to us about some of the ethics of using DNA and some of the challenges that we as society need to focus on. So first up, it's my absolute delight to introduce Drew. Okay. Well, I've been given 10 minutes to make you all expert molecular biologists. So I better get going. This is DNA in its classic double helix form, and it's from X, the model is from X-ray crystallography, so it's an accurate model of DNA. If we unwind the double helix and unzip it, you see these things that look like teeth. Those are the letters of the genetic code. There's four different types of teeth. The precise order, this is where your 25,000 genes are written. Um, you have th uh, three billion bases, three billion letters, and there's 25,000 genes in there. The pr precise order of the genes carries the coded instructions called genes. Each strand, those two strands, are complementary to the other. So if you know the sequence of one strand, you, know, you can work out the sequence of the other one. This is the key to understanding how genetic information is passed from one generation to the next. Now, the central dogma of uh, biology um, is that it, it explains how the information flows, the genetic information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. I'm going to show you that process, but first I'm going to give you a context of where, where DNA is located and how much of that stuff is down there. So again, we begin with DNA, and it's jiggling and wiggling there because of the surrounding soup of molecules that are banging against it because of thermal energy. That's Brownian motion. Now, DNA is about two nanometers across, about 20 to 30 atoms across, but in a typical, uh, an average in a, a human cell, a typical DNA strand is 30 to 40 million nanometers long. So two nanometers wide, but 30 to 40 million nanometers long. So to keep the DNA organized and to regulate access to that genetic code, it's packaged up around these purple proteins I labeled here, um, are called histones. All of this field of view you're now looking at is still a single strand of DNA. And this huge package of DNA is called a chromosome. And we're pulling out, zooming away from a chromosome. This is how it would look in a typical human cell. 
We're zooming out through a nuclear pore, which is like a, a protein gateway to this huge compartment called the nucleus that holds all the DNA. We're going out through the cytoplasm of a cell, pulling out to a view that if you look down a normal light microscope, you would see a living cell. So here's a living cell. Those uh, sausages in the center there are the chromosomes, and they're in the inside that nucleus. But the nuclear envelope breaks down, and this is, this is from live microscopy. This is what it really looks like down a microscope. And those pink purple things are, are those sausages are the, the DNA strands packaged up in the chromosomes. And they go through this very striking motion. They wiggle back and forth, and they line at the center of the cell, and then they get ripped apart. One set of DNA goes to one side, the other side gets the other set of DNA, identical copies of DNA, and then the cell splits down the middle. So now you have two daughter cells, both with identical copies of, of, of the DNA. So, and you have billions of the cells right now undergoing this process right now, um, copying the DNA or replicating with exquisite fidelity. Uh, what you saw there was actually filmed under time lapse. It would happen about three hours in real time, and um, it was sped up, so it happened in about 30 seconds. Now, next, what you're about to see is DNA's most extraordinary secret. It's how the simple code in DNA gets turned into your flesh and blood, quite literally. And here the process begins. So this is a strand of DNA, and there's a set of proteins that are marking the start of a gene. They're, they're flagging the gene. Another group of proteins comes in and recognizing that flag, and they assemble this pre-machine ready, ready to uh, read the DNA code. Three, two, one. This blue molecule, this enzyme, a protein set, is running along the DNA and is splitting apart the DNA and reading the genetic code. The DNA is acting as a template. And it's like a, like almost like a photocopying is being made. And the yellow molecule snaking out the top is called RNA, which is a close chemical cousin of DNA. Now what you're watching, again, is happening in real time inside your body. The DNA code is being read and being translated or transcribed into um, RNA in this sort of yellow ticker tape. The subunits being, being used to make the RNA enter through an intake hole, as you can see in there, and being matched letter by letter to the genetic code, making the, the transcribing uh, the DNA code into the RNA. Now, the job of the RNA is to carry this genetic code, this genetic message, out of the nucleus to another part, to another molecular machine called the ribosome for production of the protein, the gene, this particular gene codes for. So what you saw was just one gene being transcribed by this enzyme, this polymerase, into RNA. And once the RNA is outside of, of the uh, nucleus, there's a new, another molecular machine called a ribosome. Now there are several, typically several million ribosomes in each one of your 10 trillion cells. The ribosome is a complex catalytic machine that uses RNA, the RNA copy of the gene, to assemble proteins. The DNA reads the genetic code in the, in the RNA in groups of three letters, which are indicated by color there, one step at a time. As the RNA is ratcheted through this ribosome, this catalytic machine, the sequence, the RNA sequence is translated now into an amino acid chain which is in red there, uh, heading out to the top. And that amino acid chain will then fold up into a protein. As the protein synthesis proceeds, the chain of amino acids emerges from the ribosome and folds up into a precise 3D shape, which you'll see in a minute. So this is the machine that quite literally tra translates the genetic code in the DNA via RNA into a 3D molecule, which is a protein. And so that's the protein emerging there and finished and heading off. And the, and the protein, I've just picked one example, one particular protein, um, and that's hemoglobin. It, now, hemoglobin is the molecule that makes your blood red. It's also a molecular sponge. It, sits in your, it, uh, it fills all the red blood cells, and it soaks up oxygen and carries it to other parts of the body. And so what we're going to look at is one particular case where one single letter mutation causes a disease. And this, this disease, if you see on the right there, um, the red cells are normal red blood cells, and there's one that's a crescent shape, and that is sickle cell, uh, uh, red blood cell, sick, for sickle cell anemia. And this is caused by one single letter change um, in, in the gene that codes for hemoglobin. And we'll, we'll have a look at that. And so the, um, if we just imagine, you have the two, uh, the DNA strands for, that would um, code for this protein, and if you just make one letter change from A to T, it causes 
sickle cell anemia, and we'll look at the process now. So this is the uh, hemoglobin molecule freshly from the ribosome, and it actually forms a dimer, uh, and then um, there's four that get together to form a completed hemoglobin um, uh, molecule. Those blue glowing uh, objects are oxygen molecules, which are being soaked up when the, the hemoglobin is in the lungs, inside red blood cells next to the lungs. So it literally just soaks it up, and when it gets out to the extremities, the oxygen is then released. Um, but in uh, sickle cell anemia, one single amino acid chain uh, change, which I've indicated by this little green um, molecule, uh, green amino acid here, causes the hemoglobin then to stick together like a, like a molecular Velcro, and they form these long chains which distort the red blood cell, um, which then causes the sickle cell shape, which blocks red blood cell uh, uh, blood blood vessel walls, and uh, causes extreme pain and disability in people who have that particular mutation. So it really just show you the dramatic. Uh, morphological change that occur just from one single um, letter change, let alone the many others. And so I hope that gives you an entree to the sort of the nature of the science that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and that, that's where I will stop and pass on to the next. So thank you. They were really beautiful animations. And I think that the reason that even though I've seen them many times that I still get inspired by them, is that they have a wonderful combination of scientific accuracy, so it's not dumbing down complex scientific concepts, but also real beauty. And I think that's the reason Drew's been honoured both from a scientific viewpoint, but also his animations have been shown at places like MoMA and in New York. So I think it's a really nice combination. Drew really outlined that concept of information flow from DNA to RNA to protein, and a lot of the medical, biomedical research that goes on uh, in Melbourne and around the world is trying to understand what the function of those 25,000 different proteins that are encoded by the 25,000 different genes do, how those proteins work together to control different, different things like blood cell production, um, what goes wrong in diseases like cancer that involve mutation of those, of those, of those genes. So that really, if you can understand that inflammation flow, you can understand a lot of what scientists in the biomedical community are trying to do. I'm going to take you back just over 10 years to a, a, quite an odd announcement for scientists. It's not often that scientists get together with the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of UK um, through Skype and make an announcement, but this involves Francis Collins on the right, Bill Clinton and Craig Venter. Francis Collins is head of the National Institutes of Health, um, uh, or was head of the, of the Genome Project at that stage. Craig Venter was um, CEO of a biotechnology company called Solera, and Solera almost um, created a dare and said that they were going to attempt to sequence the human genome before the massively supported um, public enterprise that was going on, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. They eventually decided they were going to put their egos aside somewhat and get together and collaborate and make a joint announcement. And this announcement was the first draft sequence of the human, the human genome, which had taken probably 15 years. And I want to give you two quotes, because I think that it, it highlights um, a little bit of the ambition of the scientists, but also perhaps the folly. The first quote is that decoding the genome will change self-understanding of humanity and will be one of the strongest driving forces for the world economy. That's actually turned out to be pretty much true. There was an analysis done on the economic impact of the Genome Project in the United States in the last week. The last, the last update was about a week ago. And it was something like a 65 to 1 return on the $13 billion that has been spent on genome science in the United States. The second quote is where I think scientists sometimes get a little bit carried away with themselves about how quick the impact will be. And that was a quote from Francis Collins. By 2010, which was three years ago, but 10 years after this announcement, the field of pharmacogenomics will have blossomed and a prophylactic drug regimen based on the knowledge of a patient's personal genetic data will be precisely described. I think we still hope we might get there within 10 years, but that journey has been much more difficult. And that's really what Elise is going to talk a little bit about today. Some of the challenges that we face as a research community 
And Lone will talk about the challenges we face as a society to be able to utilise this genetic information to make healthcare more personalised. I'm going to now switch back and talk about what I think is really the great genome journey story. And that is just to give you a little taste of where this began, what were the key milestones in our understanding of genetics and where we might end up. And then I'm going to hand over to Alicia. We've actually understood a lot more about genetics for many millennia than we might expect. If you think about the, the photo on the, on the left, that is a tomb from about 4,000 years ago, where you can see on the right-hand side at the bottom and on the left corner, three different breeds of dogs. If you understand enough about domestication to be able to select for traits and to be able to create different breeds of dogs, then as a society, you understand something about genetics. And really what genetics is about is the capacity to be able to choose individuals from a particular population, selectively breed them, and end up selecting for the traits that you want. So for, for many centuries and many millennia, we've understood enough about genetics in order to be able to do agriculture and domestication and select for the traits that we need as a society. And really, when Darwin started thinking about genetics and thinking about evolution, the people that he went to were the people that had all of the data on, on artificial selection um, of things like pigeon breeds. So through the 19th century, Darwin was accumulating all of the evidence that he could lay his hands on for artificial selection in order to boost his argument that natural selection occurred. The rules of heredity, that is how we inherit genes from our parents, were worked out by Mendel. But I wanted to give you two quotes from um, a guy called Bateson who rediscovered Mendel's laws at the turn of the 19th to 20th centuries. And I really like these two quotes because they very much mirror the sorts of quotes that we saw from Venter and from Francis Collins. So Mendel also, also thought this was going to be pretty good. What he said was, an exact determination of the laws of heredity will probably work more change in man's outlook of the world and his power over nature than any other advance in natural knowledge that can be foreseen. Seems very similar to me to Craig Venter almost a century later. But I also like his second quote, which I think also shows that, that people haven't changed that much at all. There is no doubt whatever that these laws can be determined, determined. In comparison with the labor that has been needed for other great discoveries, we, we may even expect that this effort will be small. And now we think 100 years later, we're still asking the same questions. We've spent billions of dollars trying to get there. And yet Bateson in 1900 had that, that same sort of delusion that Francis Collins had in, in the year 2000, that having, having made this initial discovery, everything was going to come quickly. And I think that what that tells us is, although there is going to be great progress, and although there are going to be exciting applications of this sort of technology, it's always going to take a little bit longer than scientists expect. Drew's talked to you about a, a, a key discovery in 1953, which was Watson and Crick's discovery of the double helix. But understanding that DNA was the substance of heredity was something that took many years before that and a whole series of experiments by a large number of investigators. Again, we like to exemplify this as a eureka moment that somehow Watson and Crick made the discovery not only of the structure but that DNA was the substance of heredity and passed the traits from generation to generation. But like all of science, many more people were involved and it was a longer journey. We also like to think that the genome era really began and ended with the Human Genome Project and, and the announcement that involved Bill Clinton. Yet almost from the outset of molecular biology, um, that science was a genome science. The first genomes to be sequenced occurred by the guy at the top right called Fred Sanger who won two Nobel Prizes and he worked out the sequence of tiny little bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. And their genomes are only a few thousand base pairs in length. But in fact, that was the first sequencing project, the first DNA sequencing project ever embarked on. 
And then you can see from 1976 through to the completed human sequence in 2003, wasn't just one genome project, but the determination of the sequence of the genome of a whole lot of different organisms. In 2013, we could probably count the number of organisms whose genomes have been entirely sequenced in, in many hundreds, if not thousands. So there have been many different genome projects that have led us to our current understanding of genetics and evolution. I think really the biggest breakthrough has not come necessarily with just the completion of the Human Genome Project, but it's come with a change in technology. This graph shows on the left-hand side the cost of sequencing a single genome at different times over the last 10 or so years. In 2001, it cost more than $100 million to sequence a genome. In fact, the first genome, the estimate is something between $1 and $3 billion for the full sequence. Um, the first one listed there is actually Venter's genome. His was the first genome to be sequenced individually. The genome project that was announced by um, Bill Clinton and friends was a, a compilation of a number of different people's genomes. For seven years, the technology that was used to sequence genomes was the same technology that Sanger invented in the 1970s to sequence that tiny little virus. And that, that increase in efficiency came from automating that process. So, uh, so that efficiency is exactly like Moore's law, which is basically describes the increase in computer power for the for same unit cost. What you can see in 2007 was that we went from about $10 million a genome in 2007 down to $10,000 a genome four years later. And that came from the invention of entirely new methods for sequencing DNA. That makes a huge difference because what it allows people to do now, and the cost in 2013 is, if you want to do it, $5,000 to sequence your entire three billion base pair of genome, or a few hundred dollars to sequence that 1% of the genome that is involved in producing the proteins that Drew talked about, the meaty part of the genome. That remarkable drop in in, in price allows researchers, clinicians, and the general population to think about genome sequencing in a matter-of-fact way. Five years ago, I could never have conceived of sequencing a whole series of genomes in my laboratory in order to be able to define information about cancer onset or progression, or to begin to look for changes that predispose somebody to rheumatoid arthritis and diabetes. Bringing the cost of sequencing down from uh, $10 million to currently $5,000 opens up a whole world of possibilities that comes from that level of efficiency. I saw a beautiful analogy, and that was that if we thought of the cost of sequencing as buying a Maserati, something all young boys dream of, perhaps, the cost has now come down in relative terms to buying a Maserati for about 40 cents rather than several hundred thousand dollars. So that level of efficiency is really unprecedented in technology. What that opens up is remarkable applications in phylogenetics, that is understanding the relationship between different organisms on Earth and their ancestry. In anthropology, in ecology, now, for example, we can take out uh, a sample of seawater or uh, part of a coral reef, and rather than having to try and look at individual organisms and to grow them to study, we can harvest the DNA from that entire seawater sample or a piece of coral or the bacteria that you have in your gut, and we can sequence all of the DNA as it's mixed together and deconvolute it and work out how many different species of organisms are there. That's environmental genomics. I saw a recent idea that somebody had that I think that, that I think will work, and that is it's very difficult in a river, for example, to try and work out how many fish are there and do, how many different types of fish. There's an idea going around that it's possible to, that, that, that fish leave enough DNA in the water that if you took 10 or 20 litres of water and you precipitated the tiny amounts of DNA, that it will now be possible to reasonably accurately determine what species of fish are in a particular area and how many there are. Amazing sorts of progress in environmental sequencing. 
There's huge potential in agriculture, improving f food production. There's huge interest in synthetic biology, that is constructing organisms to do particular jobs, perhaps removing pollutants from the environment. And as Alicia is going to tell you, there's remarkable excitement in trying to use genetics to improve health. Alicia. Okay, so in this talk now, I want to tell you a bit about, as Doug alluded to, um, why we are interested in cracking the DNA code for humans, I suppose. So um, I'll just start off with a bit of a statistic, which is that the World Health Organization estimates that the global prevalence of single gene diseases at birth is about one in 100. And so knowing our DNA code can lead to much better preventions and cures in a sort of personalised approach. So we can get much more accurate diagnosis and we can start to have earlier detection and treatment of diseases and this can lead to implementing preventative measures and we can also begin to actually design drugs that might actually combat these particular mutations or variations in the DNA itself. So when we think about a personalised approach to medicine, um, in some contexts what we're talking about is giving the right treatment for the right diagnosis. So you can imagine you've got a set of patients. They've all been diagnosed with the same particular condition. And so you give them the same sorts of treatment. And some of them respond very well to the treatment. Some of them don't respond at all. And some might have some sort of bad side effects from the treatment. And we could imagine that, in fact, we can separate these responses to a tr treatment based on their DNA code. And so if you take this back, what we could do is if somebody presents with a particular condition, we can actually sequence their DNA and decide whether this person should be given a particular treatment because they'll respond well to it or they shouldn't be given it because they won't respond at all or even worse, they might have a bad side effect. So this is sort of the goal and in some contexts this is actually happening now but in most cases it is still some way in the future. So now I just want to step back and say, well, why is this problem so difficult to work on and why have, you know, we always, as Doug sort of has been talking about, allude to how much change it's going to make in the future and yet it seems to still be, um, you know, one step ahead of what we're actually currently doing. So the first thing is that the human genome is in fact very large. So... Um, the human genome, as has been said, is three billion base pairs or three billion letters. And so I like to give people an idea of how big three billion really is. So if you think of the novel War and Peace, it has about three million letters in it. So the human genome has as many letters as a thousand copies of War and Peace. So if you stacked a thousand copies of War and Peace on top of each other, you'd have a stack of books as high as an 18-storey building. And that's how many letters we have in, in, in our own personal genome in every single cell in the human body. So as Doug said, the first human genomes um, uh, were very, very expensive and they happened around you know, 10 years or so ago. And so um, there was a public and a private effort and, and they were getting cheaper and cheaper. But in the graph that Doug, Doug just showed you, um, what you can see is that we had this technological revolution about five years ago and it's really, really changed our ability to look at DNA. The thing is that these technologies don't actually spit out whole whole genomes. So that what they actually do is um, 
to, in order for these technologies to work, what you actually have to do is start cutting uh, your DNA up into tiny fragments and then sequence all these in parallel. So what it's like getting those 1,000 copies of War and Peace and sticking them through a great big shredder and every tiny piece of paper has 100 or 200 letters on it. And then we, um, then we stick all those shredded pieces of paper into our sequencing machine and the sequencer comes out reading only these tiny bits, tiny fragments of the story. And what my job, if you're wondering what a bioinformatician does, is to reconstruct all these tiny fragments back into the original genome or back into these thousand copies of War and Peace. And then if we're looking for a disease-causing variant or a, a mutation like the one that Drew showed for the sickle cell anemia, it's analogous for trying to find a typo in one of these thousands of copies of War and Peace. So that's sort of what my job involves and that's why the problem is quite difficult. So you can see the problem is quite complicated and we have to use quite sophisticated mathematical and computational techniques in order to be able to sort of decipher um, you know, the variation that's going and also to start filtering out what's important and what's not important. Because in fact, every person's genome, as I'm sure you can imagine, has actually lots and lots of differences which determine the individual differences between us all. And not all of these differences are meaningful from a health perspective, and not all of them are meaningful really um, maybe at all. So you could imagine that War and Peace might be written with English spelling or it might be written with American spelling, and so there are differences between the two copies, but they, they don't actually change the meaning of the, of the books. Um, so, so, and in fact, there are probably 30 million places or so in a human genome that could be different between any two different people. So when you're trying to look for something that is important in determining disease, this is still a very difficult problem. So I just wanted to sort of um, finish off with a couple of examples of things that we might be thinking about. So, um, for example, at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute where I work, we look for mutations which can cause heart disease, say, in children at a very young age. And when we do these sorts of um, projects where we're trying to uh, diagnose a patient or look like that in their, using their genome, we find in our experience we can do that about 30 to 40 percent of the time. And so there's still a long way to go in getting um, a genetic diagnosis for everyone who's presenting with that sort of thing. The other thing I wanted to show was that um, say for a complex trait like height, which is something I find quite interesting, um, there's in fact already over 200 variants in, in the DNA that we are know, us, know is associated with a complex trait like height, but still all of those together only explain about 10% of the variation between any individual people. So there are a lot of complex diseases and there's a lot of variants and trying to distinguish the two is very difficult. So I think it's fair to say that now we have the ability to sequence our, our, our own personal genome. So you could um, you know, spit in a test tube and send it away, pay $5,000 and get your DNA, get your own human DNA sequence for yourself and it'll come back on, on, a, on a hard disk for you. But we're really not at the stage where we can begin to interpret everything that that means. And, and that's, um, I suppose, some way in the future, although we are learning rapidly about what, what that's telling us, particularly in human health. But I suppose uh, it's a very complicated problem um, and that we're working hard to try and solve. Thanks, Alicia.
at least you're actually trained first as a physicist and then retrained after doing her PhD in mathematics and has been working in biology for the last 10 years and I think really exemplifies the sort of diverse skills we need to bring together to tackle a problem like this. And of course, the other part of the skill set that we need are people that are capable of working with scientists and with the community to try to, to I guess, the, the way I would look at it is come up with the rules for the game in this sort of technology. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Lauren Skein. Thanks, Doug. Well, as you've been hearing the previous speakers, you'll be thinking about your own DNA. And you'll be think seeing all of the things that are on offer in the future, and you might be thinking, you know, what is in this for me? Is this going to be a good thing or a bad thing for me? So I'm going to take up the theme, who owns you? and introduce some of the legal issues that we can talk about as a panel later um, as you're asking the scientists questions about what they've been explaining to you. So, my question is legally, who owns you? And immediately say, what does own mean and what does you mean? So, ownership um, covers a whole lot of different rights. It's the right to control something, to destroy it, to sell it, to benefit from its use and to commercialise it, and other things as well. So you can see there's a lot of different rights involved. And you is not only your body, but it's information that comes from your body. So who has the right to control that material and that information? And do you legally own your excised bodily material? Now, if you went home to a dinner party tonight and you said, who do you think owns bodily material that's been taken from your body? And I'll bet that everybody will say, you own it yourself. I mean, how could anybody else own it? Even thinking about the range of rights over it. But in fact, the law is that you don't own material that's removed from your body. And in fact, other people can acquire ownership rights by doing work and skill on it. So an illustration is if you have tissue that's stored at a hospital, for example, and scientists use that tissue to develop a cell line, which they're then able to commercialise, you don't have ownership rights, so you can't say get rid of it, and you don't have rights to exploit it and get benefits from it, but the people who have done the work, the scientists, may be able to exploit it and benefit from it. And then with regard to your information, you think that you own all your information. And if you say, I don't want my information to be given to anyone else, that that would be binding, that it's your information, that only you would have rights over it. But although this is generally the law, there are a whole host of exceptions where your information can lawfully be given to other people without your consent. And one example is relatives who have the same genetic risk as you do. So if I'm in the position of Angelina Jolie, for example, and I'm concerned about having the breast cancer genes, I could go and have a test and I could find out what my own status is and whether it's in my family, and I could say, don't tell my sister, I don't want her to know. And if I lived in the United States, that would be binding. But in Australia, there is a limited exception to the principle that I have complete control over who finds out my genetic information. And there's been an exception to the Federal Privacy Act that would enable a genetic counsellor to warn my relatives, my close blood relatives, that there is a genetic risk to them. And I can't stop that. I have no right of veto over it. Now, I thought in talking about whether genetic information is a good thing or a bad thing, I would recall this article 
that you may have seen in the weekend paper the weekend before last, where there's this visiting uh, American geneticist talking about having his own genome sequenced and the impact for him. So he found that he was susceptible to Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome and that there is a predisposition to cancer, breast cancer in his family. And he was pleased to have this information because he could change his lifestyle to reduce the risk. And people might then say, well, what if there is nothing you can do? If it's a condition that you find that you have where there is no cure and no intervention. But some people, in fact, want to know that information in any event because that's part of how they live their lives. So there may still be an interest even if there isn't the po possibility of avoiding the risk. So that's what he said in his article. Uh, but there are lots of other benefits of genetic information. Um, one of them is identification. And so you'll all be familiar because there are programs like this all the time on television of the power of genetics in identifying or um, eliminating suspects and in proving that people have committed offences. Uh, over the years, we're going to gain a lot of knowledge from community-wide biobanks. And the most useful biobank is one where everybody has their DNA in it. So it would be best from the community's perspective to have it compulsorily gathered for general benefit. And then for immigration and other reasons why you might want to show that there is a relationship between two people, for example, a paternity test, but there may be advantages in genetic tests there. So what are the concerns that people have? And obviously the principal concern that people have is about privacy. There is all that information about me um, which is increasingly going to be stored electronically, which could be linked to other electronic sources of information, and people might get it without my consent, and they might misuse it. So who is going to misuse it? Well, people are worried about insurance companies. And here we should emphasize that the insurance companies that are entitled to use it are life insurance companies or other income protection insurance companies, not health insurance. If you have health insurance, either public or private, there's community rating for the premiums. And you don't have to pay more if you have a serious risk because of a condition, a medical condition. But for life and income protection insurance, insurance companies are entitled to base their premium on the degree of risk that you present. And if you present a very high risk, they're entitled even to refuse to give you an insurance policy. And you have to tell them truthfully if you have any information that might affect their decision about the premium. So that's one area that people are concerned about and you may want more discussion about that later. Um, taking Doug's line, I would remind you that genetic information is just one form of predicting risk. And everyone who's taken out life insurance will know that they ask you, have you got a family history of heart disease? And you'll be sent for a medical to see if you've got high blood pressure or high cholesterol. So the genetic element is just a more specific method of, a, of testing um, to see whether you're a risk for the insurer. Uh, things like non-paternity people are worried about. Studies show that there is a much higher incidence of non-paternity in the community than many people believe. Uh, and of course, one that's had a lot of publicity in the last week is biological patents. So in Australia, the law is still that you can patent a sequence of genes, the sort of thing that Drew showed us, um, and you can use this to benefit financially by charging people who want to have access to your test. 
Uh, last week, the Supreme Court of the United States, the highest court, um, the judges unanimously held that you can't patent a gene sequence of a gene that occurs naturally in the body. Uh, if you do something to it to make it a different invention, it will be possible to patent it. Uh, this an appeal in the Myriad Genetics case in Australia, which will be heard in August, and this may be changed in Australia. Now, I want to show you just two quick um, provisions of the law that are designed and have been recently amended to respond to those concerns. So under the Disability Discrimination Act, it is unlawful to discriminate against a person in the provision of services or employing them or a lot of other ways because of a disability. And a disability is not just what you would ordinarily think of as having um, you know, a limb missing or having a, some sort of disease or something like that. It includes, because of a genetic predisposition to the disability, and one that's even imputed to a person whether they have it or not. So you can see that that is very wide ranging. Uh, if you're unlawfully discriminated against, you can lodge a complaint which may lead to a conciliation process and the payment of compensation. The other one I want to show you is from the insurance industry and an insurance company that offers life or annuity insurance can lawfully discriminate if the discrimination is based on actuarial or statistical data, but the insurance company has the onus of proving that its reasons for making that decision are well based. So in short, I've shown you some of the concerns that people have raised and some of the responses that the law has made. Um, obviously, this is an area that is constantly under review and other changes may be made in future. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, other three speakers to come up and sit down in these comfortable looking chairs for what I think is always by far the most important part of any evening like this, and that is where we throw the floor open to questions. There are three of my dear colleagues and friends who have microphones and are roaming round. Um, so please put your hand up if you have questions for any of us. We can get it started. In the front. Oh, well, let's go at the back first. Kathy Walter. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, anyone who wants to answer this question is most welcome to. In the context of DNA being able at the moment to predict existing disease, um, I see immediately the force of that. I wonder how robust the science is in enabling one to extrapolate as to likely future diseases and the impact that might have in getting it right or wrong. Thank you. Maybe I could have a go at that. Um, certainly is possible to predict some diseases with enormous accuracy. So for example, a disease like Huntington's disease is a degenerative illness that hits at about 50 years of age, 40 to 50 years of age. If you carry the mutation for Huntington's disease because you've inherited it from a parent or it's a spontaneous mutation, then you are almost inevitably going to get that illness. Other diseases, and, and Lowen gave the example of Angelina Jolie, for example, has a mutation in one of the BRCA genes, the breast cancer risk genes. Geneticists have shown that if you carry those mutations, your lifetime risk of breast or ovarian cancer is somewhere between 40 and 80%. So much higher than women in the normal population, but not a certainty. And then there are other changes that we have in our genome, differences we have in our genome, where, for example, the change may give you a relative risk of just 1% or 2% more than the general population for a disease like diabetes or heart disease. 
and it's your inheritance of 10 or 20 of those little changes that add to your risk of getting the disease. And while height is not a disease, is it, Alicia? No, <laughs> it's not a disease. While height is not a disease, there are lots of traits or characters that we have as humans where it requires many dozens or hundreds of changes in genes to, to create our physical makeup. So it's a complicated answer and it depends on the genes. Some very certain, some much less certain. And part of the challenge that we have in using the information and explaining the information is to come to terms with those subtleties and make sure as scientists and as clinicians that we have the right tools to have that conversation with the community. Down the front. And if you want to put your hands up for the next question, we can arrange the mics ahead of time and have a seamless Q&A. Um, with those amazing animations at the start, I was wanting to know, is that an actual physical representation of what's really going on, or is it kind of a visual analogy for how the you know, protein and DNA process occurs? Uh, it, 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 all of my work is derived from the, from the actual science where possible. So if there is a 3D representation, 3D model of the proteins, I bring it in directly. Um, but they are uh, a metaphor um, for humans to understand the molecular world because this is all smaller than the wavelength of visible light. Uh, color has no meaning, so that I can I bring that in as part of the, the storytelling. Um, and also a lot of the actions, although a few of the things I showed were in real time in quotes, um, they are manipulated to make them watchable to a human as well because they occur at rates that are unimaginably fast usually. So, um, but they are as accurate and they do represent our frontier, our, our current understanding. He's being a little bit modest as he always does and he was worried, he wasn't actually going to come and sit down because he was worried there were going to be no questions about the animation. I was worried there was going to be no questions about the science and only questions about the animation. Have you driven down Blackburn Road or Springvale Road past Monash and seen the synchrotron, the huge circular building that is to the, I'm trying to get my directions, the east of Monash? That building it fires X-rays round and round and round at, at high velocity, and then you fire them into crystals of proteins like the haemoglobin that Drew showed, and from the shadows and the refraction of those X-rays, you can work out the structure, the three-dimensional structure of where every atom is in that haemoglobin molecule. So you can work out in exquisite detail the shape of proteins. And Drew bases the vast majority of his animations on that exquisite atomic detail and then colours them to make them look exciting. But it really is, you know, when you show his animations to scientists, they don't say, oh, come on, Drew, you fudge that protein to make it look good. They say, wow, that really is, to me as a scientist, a beautiful representation of reality. Down here Hi. in the middle. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting you brought up before that um, science and technology seems to be um, changing how humanity sees itself. And so um, it's interesting that we often look at the disease model um, in, in order to determine whether we need help with medicine. But um, I guess with this technology racing ahead as it is, it might be interesting to consider that it, we may be able to use the technology to improve our lives. We already sink coffee like, like, a, like a, at, at amazing amounts in order to make us more productive at work or whatnot. Um, so uh, I guess I'd have to echo uh, Julian Savalescu, who came down from Oxford, who's actually an Australian, um, brought up some interesting uh, points when he spoke in Australia about uh, eugenics and the want of humans to, uh, I guess, improve and, and get better at, at doing what they're doing or improve themselves through technology and, and medicine. Would you like to I'm comment gonna on that? I'm going to handball that to loan, a big, big, <laughs> loopy handball. Yes, well, I think it's interesting, the... the the use of the word gen, um, eugenics in, this cir in these circumstances. Um, if you were planning to have a child and you knew that there was a very serious medical condition in your family, like muscular dystrophy, from which if you have boys, they will um, wither and die young, and you had the opportunity to 
use assisted reproductive technology to form a number of embryos and to have those embryos tested and have implanted the ones that are not affected by this awful condition, and you chose to do that, would you describe this as eugenics? And it seems to me that that word is so value-laden with the, the Nazi experiments. And so that's my first thought. Um, the second one is trying to improve your health. So if you knew that you were the sort of person who could run a marathon, or you're better over sprinting, because you've had a genetic test that tells you something about the way your muscles work, is that a bad thing? I mean, that's to make you a, a better sportsman. So I think that there's a lot of language that's used about these sorts of things that shouldn't be. I think there's a huge opportunity to use this sort of information for what we now call wellness rather than treating disease. And I think that's in part about what your question got to. Um, that, is, that is taking steps that you know, we all periodically take, often after New Year's Day, about making resolutions for better health. But the information that you have around your own personal genetics can make those resolutions stick far better. There's some really interesting bodies of work that if you can personalise a prevention or a wellness strategy, then people will stick with that far more than if it's just general advice. I think the other thing that I find really interesting, and Lone and I talked about that today as we were coming back from the ABC studios in a taxi, and that is some of what I would have considered quite conservative, religiously conservative communities have really embraced exactly the sort of technology that we talked about. Within the Ashkenazi Jew population, there are a whole set of genetic illnesses that have a much higher frequency. And it's well regarded now within that population that you have genetic counselling before marriage. So I think if you can explain to communities the risks and the benefits associated with adopting particular technologies and have the sorts of discussions that we're having as a community today involving people with lots of different skills, then the general population is much willing to embrace new technology. The Cypriot community, again, predominantly an orthodox community, have made decisions about genetic testing to avoid blood cell diseases that are so prevalent in Cyprus that if they went unchallenged, would bankrupt the country in treating their population within a few years. So again, uh, a, a, a community that has deep religious values, capable of being sophisticated enough, having had discussions among themselves, to adopt technologies when they see the benefit is great. And I really get inspired by a forum like today where we have two or 300 people from the community on a dark winter night that are willing to discuss and debate and, um, and, and embrace uh, discussions about technology because I think that really is the sort of discussion we need as a society to be able to make the right decisions. And the scientists are not the ones making the decisions and the lawyers are not the ones making the decisions. It has to be a decision we come to as a community. Next question. Up the back, in the blue. Um, we've already heard twice how far off predictions can be, but I was just curious to hear uh, how far you think genetic therapy might be in terms of even simple diseases like color blindness that are you know, easy to predict, but can, we, can definitely happen out there. I'm going to answer that as well, unless you guys want to have a go at it. I think there's two questions there. One is, there's a difference between a therapy we can use based on genetics and what I would call gene therapy. So I think there's been, a, and there's been a huge amount of hype and promise about both of those. We're capable today of making informed choices clinically about your treatment based on your genetics. So for example, if, you are going, if you're going in for an operation that requires a general anaesthetic, there are changes in your DNA that we can look at or points of your DNA that we can look at to predict whether you'll have a catastrophic reaction to a particular anaesthetic and then go into a coma on the table. So today there are a whole host of decisions we can make clinically about your personal genetics. Gene therapy is a far more difficult 
set of um, medicines. And that is where what is we've identified a gene that is perhaps mutated within your genome, and we take a piece of DNA and we put it into cells in your body to repair that genetic change. That has had a huge amount of promise over the last 20 years. There have probably been a thousand or more clinical trials and precious few successes. The successes have involved where it's possible to put the new gene into an adult stem cell that you have in your body and use that to reconstitute a particular tissue like the blood. And so there have been successes in those areas, but they've been limited. And the trick is to be able to get, is to be able to repair the gene in a way that doesn't leave any damage behind in the repairing and to be able to get it into enough cells to make a difference. So huge technological challenges. And you're right that it's been hyped up enormously. And I have to say, I'm not clear when gene therapy, that is the repair of genetic defects, is going to be widespread. Anything to add? Or are you happy for me to take that one? Next question. Down the front here, uh, up the back, and then we have another question down in the front. Hi, thank you for your talks. It's been very informative. I've got a question regarding the US Supreme Court ruling um, for Peyton. Lone, you say that in the ruling they say that it can still be, a human gene can still be patentable if it's been modified to a certain extent, to which I guess is how long is a piece of string and is there a precedent that we have for that? I also have a bit of a follow-up question for that, in, uh, but I'd like to hear your answer first. Yes, well, the reason why um, the, the gene was not patentable was it was the same gene that you have inside your body, and the only thing that had happened was that it had been taken out of the body. So this was like a discovery, and usually you can't patent a, a discovery. You have, can only patent an invention. So there's got to be an innovative step that changes something that is found in nature um, into something else that is useful. And so th it wasn't, that wasn't the case with this. Now, what they described, they, they call it a synthetic gene, but it would be something that um, is, I can't tell you, I mean, I take your point about the, the piece of string, and I can't tell you exactly what you would have to do to it, but there would have to be this innovative step that changes something that is found in nature into something that is, um, meets the test of an invention. Yeah, because I was wondering if that opened the door for, say, a hybrid of synthetic and also natural occurring nucleotides to form a particular gene. But the second part of my question was, we already have synthetic oligos available for commercial production um, and use in research. Now, are those still covered by, say, that particular ruling? Because it is a completely synthetic piece of DNA. Well, despite if it's, it mimicking if it's like something an that you could say has been invented, then it could be covered by, by a patent. So I don't know if there's a patent on that or not, but if there were and it was an invention, um, that would continue to apply. It wouldn't be affected by the principle in the Myriad Genetics case. Okay, because I was more referring to like, um, say influenza particular sequence in it has been replicated but purely synthetic. So there's been lots of, lots of DNA synthesised, so I don't think the synthesis of a particular piece of DNA from a research viewpoint is going to break patents. So as a researcher over 25 or 30 years, I've never stopped doing an experiment or pursuing a particular avenue of inquiry because of the existing patent literature, right? So I've, you know, my, my and probably all my colleagues' attitude is come sue me, right? We're not making much money. Um, the chances of you getting a lawsuit up to stop a researcher doing experiments are zero. I think that, and, and again, we've discussed this today, there was a push in the Australian Parliament to ban patents on any biological substances, and I presented to the Senate inquiry on that patent. And if you say that quickly, let's ban, let's ban patents on any biological substances, kind of sounds like a good idea, something that nobody could disagree with. But what we have to remember is a lot of the medicines that we use today are medicines that are based on biological substances. There are wonderful treatments for arthritis and cancer that involve monoclonal antibodies that are engineered to block one particular protein in your body 
and not have horrible side effects like we would have with chemotherapy and are fabulously effective. Now, we need to be able to provide somebody with the incentive investing one to two billion dollars to take those from a good idea in a laboratory like mine to a product that your GP can prescribe. And the patent system is one way of providing an incentive through a monopoly in exchange for an obligation of that company to publish their findings as the patent becomes public. So it's a double-edged sword. We could get rid of patents for biological, for biological materials, cells, proteins, DNA, RNA, all of the things that Drew talked about, but I think that that would very quickly dry up investment in new pharmaceuticals or diagnostics. So we need that balance and we need to find a way to ensure research is driven hard and innovations are taken into the clinic and into the market, but that we have patents that are reasonable and fair and don't stifle innovation. So yeah, we've got it, to remember it, also that, the, the, that this monopoly only lasts for a limited period, yeah. usually 20 years, but after that, the invention is then available for everyone to use without, holding, uh, the, without having to pay the patent holder. And it, there's, the other misconception is that pa patents lead to secrecy. And in fact, it's exactly the opposite. The, 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 the payback for giving somebody, a, a company, a monopoly over, a over licensing a particular invention is that that invention is publicised and searchable and others can use it to advance knowledge. So it's, a, again, a, a compromise. Uh, Up uh, there with the microphone and then the lady in the red coat. Uh, why is it so difficult to interpret uh, DNA uh, information? Alicia Oshlak, why is it so difficult to interpret DNA? I suppose if you, if you look at a single person's DNA, then what you find is that you have so many, you might have, you know, half a million differences from what you um, are used to seeing. And then, so, so when you look at the DNA, you might have a lot of differences. And then you look at the person and you see a lot of differences. You know, they, they have different colour hair, they, you know, they different might have heights. different heights. <laughs> They might have different diseases and that sort of thing. And so to match up those differences between what you're seeing between individuals is obviously a, a very difficult task. Um, that's a sort of a, a massive simplification of the problem. When, when, and I suppose, you know, a lot of the time what we're interested in might be disease. And, in the case of a disease, what's happening is that you will have a gene and you'll have an error in a gene, which is like what Drew described with the sickle cell anemia, that actually disrupts the function of that protein. And, and so we can sort of narrow down our search when we see somebody presenting with a disease. And what we do is we say, OK, we, we're now only interested in things that are in genes, and genes are maybe 1% of the genome, so then we've narrowed down our search. Okay, we're only going to look into genes. When you do a whole genome sequence, you still might see um, 50,000 or 100,000 differences that occur in genes. Then we narrow down even further. We say, okay, well, not all differences in genes are actually going to cause a problem with that, um, with, with that protein product. And so then we can start doing sort of predictions about how a change in a DNA sequence might affect the structure of that DNA. And these are all predicted sort of things. And, and sort of that's how we try and sort of narrow down what we're trying to predict. I hope that's like a sort of horrible, horrible jigsaw puzzle. Yes. And you could add that there are lots of other reasons why a person might be sick. Or behave in a particular so way. So environmental aspects, obviously, mm. um, and so uh, and in that respect, you're not going to, you know, if somebody catches a cold, you're not going to go and sequence their genome to see why they caught that cold because it's not in your DNA, right? It's in a virus that you've 
ingested. So, so you know, uh, it's not going to cure every sickness. It, you know, you have to check that it's a, it's actually a genetic disease that that you might have, of course. The lady in red, and then the gentleman in green. This is a question for Professor Skeen. Um, do you believe that the law <laughs> that the law in Australia is adequately keeping pace with genetic developments to address particularly some of the concerns that you raised with genetic testing? Well, it's very difficult in an area of rapid change. Uh, laws can be developed after community consultation and new acts can be passed and then something is discovered that's quite different from what they anticipated. And so you have to keep going back to the laws. Every time a law is changed, you have lengthy consultation and then it's got to go through both houses of parliament. So this takes a long time. So I think it's inevitable that the law will always be in the rear and limping a little, um, to quote one of our high court judges, uh, because it's, you can't anticipate what's going to happen next. Um, I think it's important, as Doug said, that we've got to keep talking about what our values are and to um, try and reflect that as much as possible in law. Uh, I think we should also make great use, as Australia always has done, with ethical guidelines, like the ones developed by the National Health and Medical Research Council, uh, which are much easier to change. So if you have a new development, a new scientific development, uh, you can immediately put it out for consultation, well, immediately is within a year or so, um, and change the, the ethical guidelines, which provide guidance for people on how to behave in particular circumstances. Thanks. Here, and um, then the front. Can we have a microphone down to the front row? Uh, I'm a bit embarrassed because I, I've got a bit of a block my age probably, but I can only think of the word vaccination. But these type of things are given to, 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 to children who have just been born, being given to adults, which sometimes have caused the child they're carrying um, to die uh, because of genetics and, and uh, religious groups have been um, suspicious and sometimes refuse these things on those type of grounds. Now with this investigation could one then assure a person who has been recommended a jab of that description that it won't be damaging to them so there'd be a, there's a huge, there would be a huge piece of research needed to be done to understand how the genes that, for example, control the immune system and therefore the reaction to any vaccine, vaccine. would dictate um, would dictate, for example, an adverse response. Mm -hmm. If anybody here is interested in the safety of vaccines, there was an absolutely wonderful documentary on SBS that was recently aired. That what was it called? jabbed, thank you to the young girl in the front row, um, whose memory is far better than mine, was called jabbed, that would be a must see for everybody in the community. An absolutely wonderful piece of work that um, in a, a very matter of fact way describes both the risks and the benefits of vaccination. Thank you. So great question. And then one, one, another question, can genes repair themselves over a period of three or four generations where there's been damage? Uh, Yes, absolutely. So there's, you know, in each generation, there is, so within a cell, we call, you know, there's lots of different ways of thinking of generations. Drew showed you a beautiful picture of a cell dividing in the body. So we have many generations of cells within our body. Cells, daughter cells, granddaughter cells that have gone through one, two, three, four, five divisions. As the DNA replicates, and Drew showed you that opening up and the reading of the letters, about one in a thousand times that a letter is put in, it's the wrong letter. But the beauty of the DNA machinery is that it corrects itself, sees that there's an error, comes back, proofreads, edits, and puts the right nucleotide back in. So at the end point, the error rate may be one in several million rather than one in a thousand. So from a cellular viewpoint, there's, there's DNA repair occurring all the time, and there's a whole lot of those proteins that Drew talked about whose only job is to recognise errors and repair DNA. 
Next question, down the front. Hi, uh, this is a question for Drew. Um, I spent 20 years teaching chemistry at both school and university level, and I have to say that that was the most beautiful representation of uh, the uh, replication of DNA that I've ever seen. And I was wondering if we could see it again because the first time wasn't enough. <laughs> Would people like to see the animations again? <laughs> Come on, an encore, Drew. Right. Okay. And I should say that up the back on the table are little packets that have CDs in. What's your name? Thank you, Sam. She's been fantastic. And I've never met her before tonight, so I'm, I haven't installed a helper in the front row. There's a whole lot of uh, little packets with CDs in that show not just these animations, but other animations. And if you Google We High TV, there are a whole lot of animations of Drews that are present on the internet. Yeah. There so, you go, Sam. Um, if this is on. Um, so all, all of, almost pretty much all of our work, uh, which we've been accumulating now for about 15 years, is online uh, at no charge, and we, we distribute to schools all around the world. We have um, large programs in Australia and in the US particularly to get this material out there. So um, if you go on YouTube and uh, Google uh, or YouTube and just type in WeHi or WeHi.tv, um, you'll see all of our work and there's lots of different levels of narration and so on. So uh, we provide it in lots of different ways and we use it, we, our material is also used in documentaries, um, museum exhibits like at Museum Victoria and around the world and so on. So it's, it, we do, a, we have a massive effort to, for public outreach. Come on, let's get the um, You want to play an animation? No okay, I'll play you one. I'll play you the, the hottest, um, the most important one. In fact, I think Doug was kind of expecting me to play it today, but I didn't. Um, and that was, it was actually really a turning point for me because um, it, I, I thought, I bid it for 2002 for James Watson for the 50th discovery of the double helix. And it shows you the DNA uh, replication uh, mechanism. And um, if I have it here, I do. Um, I was looking for a good one. <clears throat> You're not getting it on screen. Okay, hopefully they'll switch it over in a moment. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, can we switch it over to the laptop again? Yes. This one um, is an accurate representation of the actual DNA replication machine. When I created it, I thought it would be a complete disaster because it was too technical. And it's actually turned out to be the most important animation ever created. And uh, this is the one that ends up in art galleries and so on. So what you have, this is the actual DNA replication machine that you have incurring inside of you, at least the science of 2002 when I built it. The DNA is entering the production line from the left-hand side and it's being split into those two strands. Uh, and the two strands are then being copied. Uh, one strand can be copied directly and it can be seen being copied off to the right-hand side there by the purple molecule, which is um, uh, uh, replicating it. But things aren't so simple for the other strand because mechanically it actually runs backwards. So it's thrown out repeatedly in these loops and copied one section at a time. But that collection, this machine, this molecular machine you're looking at, um, is a group of proteins that get together and each one has a task to do. Um, and this is actually as is occurring in real time inside of you. And so the blue donut shaped molecule is doing the splitting and there's other molecules that are doing checking and proofreading and, and, and uh, preparing it for copying. And um, this, this mechanism also has error correction. So if there is an error that's made, it can stop, fix the error and keep on going. So you have on average about um, eight of these machines per cell. So you have billions of this machine whirring away at this speed right now inside of you. And it does represent um, the, the very latest of what we understood in 2002, but broadly, this mechanism is about right for what we understand today. So with that, I'll stop. So. And again, if you want any of these animations, go to www.wehi, that's wehi, the Walton Eliza Hall Institute, .tv. And a burning question at the front as no, well. No, no, it was just that I was really interested in seeing the one where it expanded from the molecular level out to the cellular level. That was quite uh, you, amazing. But that's all. I, I'll look it up on the internet. Yeah. And a big thank you to all the teachers here because mm -hmm. I think if you talk to any research scientist, the reason that they are in the job is that there was a teacher at primary school or high school or a lecturer at university who inspired them. So from us, a big thank you to you. In the middle here, and then three along, and then we will keep going.
uh, this lecture is really insightful, and uh, it, uh, it seems that the, the gene science is so powerful to wipe out or prevent possible human diseases. Everybody knows that bird flu disease has caused many disastrous effects, and uh, since, the, since the newest type of bird flu disease emerged in China at the first half of this year, many Chinese people are very reluctant to eat chicken. It has, uh, it has had a very negative impact on Chinese chicken business. So my question is, professors, do you have great faith that possibly one day we might cure or prevent bird flu disease genetically? Thank you. So that's a, that is a really good question. And when I put the list of genome projects that have been carried out on the slide, it was for exactly that sort of question. So when we think about sequencing genomes, I mentioned that we've sequenced the genome of many thousands of different organisms. One of the genomes that we've sequenced is the genome of the influenza virus. So nowadays, what you'll hear is you'll hear of there being new influenza strains that haven't yet caused any epidemic, but that we find in poultry farms, in wild duck populations, in bird populations. And therefore, what we can start to do, although, we, although we're not at the point of being able to pre prevent epidemics yet, is that we can begin to identify when there are risky influenza strains within the environment that we need to keep an eye out for. So I'm not sure that we are yet at the point of being able to predict of those people in the community that get a, a, an avian influenza infection, those that are going to be able to fight that infection off and those that are going to be genetically at risk. We know that people that have reduced immune systems, um, some of the elderly, people on immunosuppressive drugs and those sort of things are at particular risk and certainly we can take preventative actions. But I think we're a way off from preventing that sort of epidemic. But genome science generally, not the Human Genome Project, has got an absolutely pivotal place to pay, play in understanding the spread of epidemics, whether that is um, infectious disease like malaria or influenza viruses or other diseases, TB. Three along. Hello. Yo, um, just wanted to say you guys were wonderful. Um, I'm a simple primary school teacher married to a scientist, so that was just, especially the animations, and you guys explained yourself incredibly well. Um, on that note, we're here tonight listening to you explaining everything in high detail. Obviously, this issue is going to become something kind of like vaccinations are a hot topic, and the issue I have is you meet a lot of conspiracy theorists and people who go onto Google, find the first bit of information, the first 10 hits, they take that and they start believing in it and spreading it. And it's a big issue. I even met teachers who believe this stuff, and I think it's terrible. Um, what do you think the science community needs to do to sort of start getting what you know out there in a better way, <clears throat> excuse me, in a better way? And I don't mean to be critical, but, you know, people use the internet more and more as their first source of information. So just, just decoding it and making it simple for either your average Joe, your average primary school teacher, so that people... Um, you know, are putting the right information out there. I'm going to give a, a big plug. You as a primary school teacher can do far more at equipping the kids that you bump into to be critically thinking. So, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the most important elements that science brings is an ability to look at data for yourself and make a judgment. There's a wonderful program of science primary school teaching called Primary Connections that's brought out by the Australian Academy of Science and understands that it's not possible for you as a primary school teacher to be teaching 10 or 12 hours of solid science a week. So their, their real genius has been to um, wrap science education up with literacy and numeracy, which is something core to every primary school class. So if there are any primary school teachers there that are looking for material to be able to teach primary school kids in a sophisticated way about science without them even almost being, uh, knowing that they're being taught about science, um, I would really urge you to look at primary connections. And there's a new program that the Academy of Science is bringing out that is for secondary school students that's called Science by Doing. 
So if you're looking for curriculum material and teacher training to, to be able to, to present that material in an informed way, I'd really urge you all to go to the Australian Academy of Science website. But then I think there's fora like this, there's television programs that have been put together like Jabbed, um, a whole lot of ways that I think scientists and the community need to engage. And you're absolutely right, we have an obligation as scientists and ethicists and animators to make science um, interesting and exciting and not talk in a patronising way to the community. You know, I think one of the reasons genetically modified food got such a bad rap is that that group who were, who were the proponents of, of Monsanto and whoever else are the companies that are doing genetically modified food didn't have a conversation with the community about risk and benefit. They assumed the genius of their technology was going to shine through without explanation. And I think Australians are remarkably progressive in adopting technologies from mobile phones to genetic medicines if the risks and benefits are discussed in an open way. The chap in the beret. I was just interested, um, I'm a VC biology teacher, but I was interested in whether this technology is going any closer to discovering what all the other stuff, not the genes, but the other stuff, what it does. Because you're sort of saying about the complexities of sequencing and then matching yep. them up and then obviously if you know what gene you're looking for and what protein, you can just say, yep, that's it. But what about the other stuff? That is a really good question. And I have to say that it is... Uh, an area that's being worked on very actively. We are getting, and I would describe the progress as little candles in an enormous dark cavern. And so, you know, I think initially 15 years ago we thought of the genes that encode, encoded the proteins and some of the RNA machinery, that's a little bit of an extra detail, and then the junk, and we called it the junk DNA. Now, in fact, what we found is larger and larger part of the genome that isn't involved in encoding proteins is playing a regulatory role. So a lot more of it is transcribed into RNA and plays then a role in regulating which genes are turned on and off in particular cell types. So, for example, we have 25,000 genes in every one of our cells, but not every one of our cells uses all of those genes. Hemoglobin gene is needed to be used very actively in a red blood cell, but if you're a nerve cell, you need to turn the hemoglobin gene off because you don't need to carry oxygen. And so there's a whole lot of RNA that's encoded in the junk that helps regulate which genes are transcribed in which cells. And that broadly is something we call epigenetics, the regulation around the genome or over the top of the genome. But I think there's still a view that there are large amounts of the genome that really serve no useful purpose we can, we can discern. And that, that's going to be, continue to be a really active area of, uh, of research. The lady in the turquoise cardigan. It was mentioned that um, patents allow for information to be more accessible rather than this whole secrecy thing. Um, my question is that does this actually restrict research to labs that can only afford access to this information? Well, in order to get a patent, you have to describe what you've done in the course of your invention in a way that other people can do the same sort of thing. So I, think, I don't think that this adds to the, the cost of um, getting the patent. For other people, they have to pay to use the patent once, once the um, invention is patented. And though, as Doug was intimating, often a patent won't be enforced against a, a researcher or a research institution, um, not only because they don't generally have a lot of money, but also because it's believed to be in the community good that yeah. research should be done. I think you were also maybe intimating at a slightly different nuance, and that is, you know, one of the things that concerns me is that, for example, if it costs $5,000 to sequence the genome and Medicare doesn't give you a reimbursement, 
then are only the people living in the North Shore of Sydney and in Turak going to be capable of accessing that? And I think you hit on one of the grand challenges that faces Australia as a nation, and that is, I will guarantee that there will be amazing breakthroughs in medicine that are developed at institutes like mine and institutes like the one that, that Alicia works in. It takes us five, 10, 15, 20 years of working at the bench before we make a discovery that is capable of being translated into the clinic. I think it would be the most hollow of victories for, an instant, for, for a lab like my own to make a breakthrough that, for example, may allow women with particular types of breast cancer to, invo to avoid horrible chemotherapy if that, that new medicine was only affordable by a subset of the population. So the big challenge we have as a community is how do we ensure Australians benefit from the fruits of health and medical research, but in a way that doesn't bankrupt the country? Because healthcare costs currently about $140 billion a year and are going up by 7 to 8% per annum and will only increase as the population ages towards 2050. So we need a sophisticated conversation as a community with our politicians. You know, I would hate to be the health minister because you're trying to constrain a budget in an area that is ballooning and every single person in the community who has a particular disease, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, arthritis, is getting on the web is Googling breakthroughs, understands what's being developed in the United States, and is demanding access to those therapies here. And those therapies may cost $30,000, $50,000 a year. So we need, as a community, through fora like this, to be working with our politicians to be able to develop a policy that will allow us to rise to that challenge. So I think you've hit the nail on the head, and I hope one day you're in Canberra as a parliamentarian, really addressing what I think is one of the great issues that confront the country. I've been told, what's the time? Eight o'clock. I think we'll do three more questions. Okay, one here at the front. Who else? Put your hands up high. One at the front here. Thanks. Thanks. Um, this is probably to um, Professor Leone, um, and following on from the last question, do you envisage that one day the um, insurance companies will ask more and more people for their DNA? Loanne? It's very important to, to emphasise that insurance companies not only don't ask for your DNA, but neither do they require you to take a genetic test. And I don't think that this would be altered because it is su such a, um, a sensitive issue. Um, they are entitled to ask you questions, and if you know the answer, you have to tell them. And if you don't, they can avoid the policy. Um, but I don't think that will change. I think what will change is that they will be held increasingly to explain their decisions. And at the moment, there's not a great deal of information about how to assess risks, particularly over time, caused by genetic factors. So I think a lot of research will be needed, be needed um, with regard to that. And insurance companies may, in fact, find that they're not taking so many of these risks into account uh, in setting premiums once they get more information about the impact of particular risks. The penultimate question, right at the back. Uh, thank you so much for letting us know the usefulness and the risk behind the genetic uh, determination. Uh, my question is, what would you suggest uh, to the common people who is really interested to know what is inside him? What, whether you would suggest to uh, let him sequence the genome or not? That is a really good question. What would, Loan? what advice would you give to a member of the community who said, should I send my $99 to 23andMe or some other co company and get a little snapshot of my genome or should I send $5,000 to Illumina to get my whole genome sequenced? What would your well, advice be? Well, most of the people who've done it say that they haven't got a lot out of it. It just, it yet. just tells you, yet. 
Um, if, you, if you're at risk of something that's really serious, this might be a, a, a cheap way to, to get your whole genome done, which will tell you about the bit that you're interested in. But for those of us who just might do it out of interest, and because it's something new and exciting to have on your, on your UBS stick, um, then what are you going to, to get out of it? You know that you've got a slightly increased risk of this, slightly decreased risk of that, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really add up to anything. So would I do it? I don't think I would at the moment, no, even the cheap one. Look, I think there's, there's a, a big discussion about how one uses this information. I would certainly consider having my own genome sequenced if I knew that there was something clinically actionable, something that I needed to be able to do clinically or preventatively um, around a particular scenario. So if I was going in for surgery and I knew I was going to get an anaesthetic, um, I, I think I would like to know whether I was going to have an adverse event. So when there's something specific that is genetically linked, then I think I would be motivated enough to go and get the test. Um, I think what Loanne has really emphasised is that we're on the cusp of this being useful to everybody in the community, but there is a huge body of work to be done, not so much around the science of doing the sequencing, but how we take the information and how we work with genetic counsellors and doctors to, to interpret the information and provide it to members of the community or patients in a way that is understandable, digestible and useful. Last question. <coughs> we humans have interfered a lot with everything, including industrialization and also domestication of species, uh, deforestation and everything, and has caused a great impact on the environment. How do you envisage that DNA technology will affect our own species? Look, I guess my view is you know, I'm eternally optimistic and very much a half glass full sort of person. I think you're right that humans have intervened in the environment in a myriad different ways, but I really celebrate the sort of intervention in the environment that means there are kids, there are not kids in Australia dying from preventative infectious diseases as there were 40, 50, 60 years ago. That for the majority of Australians, indigenous populations aside, for example, our rate of rheumatic heart disease has gone down by a factor of a thousand. So I really celebrate the advances that, that technology in health that technology has driven. And I think that genome sciences will play a role, not won't be the, the solution, but will play a role in similar advances over the next 40 or 50 years. I think we'll end it there. Everybody's had a great lot of questions. Can I firstly thank my co-panel members for um, what I found to be very inspiring presentations? <laughs> Can I encourage any students at secondary school or university who are at all thinking about science as a career to consider that very seriously from my own viewpoint, and I know from Alicia's, it is an absolute privilege to work in an, an area that has something new to discover every day. If you're interested in science, then really grit your teeth and push on with it. There is an open invitation to anybody who is interested in health and medical research to visit the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute as part of a public tour. If you go to our website, www.wehi.edu.au, we have discovery tours and public lectures. I would love to see your faces there. And finally, from the panel, can I thank you all for being part of what is such an important community event in discussing science in a really sophisticated way. So thank you for the discussion.